Welcome everybody and thank you for joining this webinar. Title of this webinar is Powering Tomorrow and Mitigating Heat Urban Island, Unleashing the Potential of Sustainable Cooling in Europe. Uh, my name is Emin Martini and I will be your moderator for today. And I'm policy officer at EGEC, the European Geothermal Energy Council. So to introduce uh, this webinar, uh, we can say that uh, another after another summer of a precedent high temperature uh, and heat island effect, several cities around Europe experienced many challenges to implement efficient and effective cooling solution without overbordering the electricity grids. Uh, in the pursuit of a sustainable future, it is imperative to comprehend and manage the cooling demand of both residential and non-residential buildings, such as data centers uh, across Europe. Uh, to this purpose, we want to present you this uh, webinar, which will propose an approach that will allow to assess the future growth of cooling demand in the coming years, taking into account factors such as climate change and building retrofitting. By leveraging data derived from European strategical sources and detailed building load profiles, this webinar will show it is possible to value the cooling demand of building in Europe for every country. So let's have a look at the agenda before starting. So after this short introduction, our first speaker, which is Chiara Cagnazza for ECMWF, uh, will tell us about uh, the problem of island effect, which is uh, a big emerging problem in Europe. Uh, then Mattia Chinello, which is an energy engineer at Red Company, uh, will explain uh, the cooling down uh, methodology to assess the building's cooling demand in Europe. Uh, then we will have a couple of very interesting uh, examples. The first one presented by Borja Badanes uh, from the University of Valencia uh, will show, you the, will show us the, the shallow geothermal cooling and the case of Valencia and the problem that also the city had in terms of overburdening of the electricity grid. Uh, and to finish, we will have a look also at the example of data centers with the example of the University of Strasbourg presented by Jean-Baptiste Bernard, uh, managing partner at uh, EQ uh, Engineering. Uh, before letting the floor to the first speaker, I want to say that also this project is, is done uh, together with uh, the Cooling Down Consortium. Uh, and Cooling Down is uh, a project funding by the LIFE program uh, of the European Commission uh, whose uh, specific aim in this case is to um, showcase uh, different uh, solution in terms of uh, calling coming from renewable sources. So uh, let's start with the first presentation. I'll leave the, the floor to uh, Chiara Cagnazzo. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for inviting me um, to the seminar. Uh, so uh, the presentation now is going to cover mostly um, and we talk about heat and, and about how climate change has been affecting heat um, in recent decades, and also which are the tools that we have to predict um, so that any action can be taken. Um, I will start with an overview of what we know at the European level and then with some zoom at the city scale level. And this is a presentation done in collaboration um, with uh, Claudia Di Napoli and Big Gates at TCNWF. So, uh, very, um, yes, uh, very fast. Uh, ECNWF is the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. And we are uh, both, in, uh, we are an international uh, intergovernmental organization with 34 member and cooperating states. And ECNWF has um, been the leading center for weather forecast uh, in the last 50 years and now is a key player of the Copernicus programs that for which I have um, a, next, uh, a next slide. So ECNWF has the three different sites, one in Reading, one in Bonn, where I am located, and one in Bologna, and we are about uh, 400 start, uh, staff members coming from 30 different countries. So as I said, um, ECNWF is part of this Copernicus program. Copernicus is the uh, EU program on Earth observation, so it keeps access um, open and free access to uh, data uh, from satellite and in situ data. Um, it, it's a very big program, about 6 million euros program. And on top of those Earth observation data, there are um, thematic services to, to give value to those data. And um, the ones that you see into this slide in colors are um, the one where ECNWF is leading or involved. So ECNWF 
um, is uh, um, is implementing two of those thematic services, the Copernicus Climate Change Service and the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service, and is largely involved uh, in the Emergency Management Service. Uh, just in a nutshell, um, see, uh, focusing on the Copernicus Climate Change Service, where the examples are based on in the next slides mostly, this is uh, um, an operational climate service uh, embedded in the entire Copernicus Earth Observation Program, and it actually provides uh, open access to state-of-the-art uh, um, data and information for the current climate, the past climate, and the future uh, possible evolution of the climate. Everything is open source, everything is uh, um, quality controlled uh, and fully transparent. So. So why are we are we talking about heat? Because heat poses um, threat to the to the human health, um, and this is mostly because in the form of uh, heat stress. Um, and actually, it is uh, now well established that heat stress can cause a variety of health programs. So for example, dehydration. Um, uh, I'm sorry that I have some um, message picking up. Um, so uh, in practice, what happens is that um, um, when, when a heat wave happens, uh, there are groups of people who are uh, mostly the ones that are exposed and they are, and they are elderly people who have previously medical conditions that are the most affected by heat stress. However, during heat stress, what happens is that there are also a high um, demand um, of, of cooling. Okay, so why now are we talking about cities? So Cities are at risk because the, of the urban heat island phenomenon, as you were um, introducing, Emil, in your introduction. And this is um, uh, and may cause a doubling um, uh, in the number of, 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 of annual number of heat wave days compared, I mean, in the, in the urban areas with respect to the rural areas. Um, we expect uh, a rising uh, demand for space cooling, and this is putting an enormous strain on electricity systems in many countries. Uh, if we look at the uh, next time scales and we look at the climate projections, those indicate that there will be um, um, population exposure to extreme heat that will rise uh, by more than an order of magnitude toward the end of the century. But also, if you look at the entire Europe, uh, there is a, lo a lot of discrepancies and differences across different regions in Europe, so that if we look at the South and Central Europe especially, uh, those areas will be at a high risk. So this is just to highlight that also within Europe, uh, we are not all equal or equally exposed. So we pass now to the uh, to the data that are um, used to, to understand and to study heat and heat exposure and heat waves. Uh, one example are the data that are provided uh, freely and open access to those Copernicus programs, in particular at TCNWF, we produce this heat stress information based on historical climate data. In practice, um, we use climate data on air temperature, on humidity, on wind, insulation to calculate what is named as the universal thermal climate um, index. And this is a metric that describes the heat stress um, that body undergoes um, during, uh, um, during heat conditions. And you can see into the right hand side of this slide that the heat stress index gives information going from the extreme heat to the, to the very extreme cold stress. Actually, those data are uh, open access, freely accessible through the Copernicus Climate Data Store. And they cover the period that goes from the 1940s um, up to today. And those data are based on what we call on reanalysis, climate reanalysis. So what is a climate reanalysis? A climate reanalysis is a reconstruction um, of the historical climate uh, over, over atmosphere, over land and over ocean, uh, mostly um, covering now the time period from 1940 to today and putting together billions of observations. You can imagine this reconstruction hour by hour everywhere with no gaps in space and time um, of, the, of, the past, of the past meteorology and past climate. And this is one of the most used data set also uh, at the Copernicus Climate Change Service and gives information in near real time with five days behind real time. So this data set is used in many, many different applications and many different examples. One of those is a, is a use that the Copernicus Climate Change Service itself do in, in, in its effort of uh, monitoring the climate, uh, the climate of Europe. So we regularly report um, the, the, the current the, the climate of Europe for the last year, and we put the European climate in the context of the past by using a lot of this information about the reconstruction of the climate. So if we go and we'll take a look uh, at some section of this state of the climate report, 
This report contains many different uh, areas, many different sections. And one of those is related to listing key events of the previous year. This is the example of the state of the climate that was published in 2023 and what re was reported in the climate of year 2022. For example, year, uh, for year 2022, we have seen the warmest summer on record in Europe. Now, if you think of what's happening in summer for, for 2023, we know that at the global level, uh, summer 2023 was the hottest on record in the globe, not the hottest uh, for Europe itself. Um, in, in the figure, you can see, um, for example, that um, in this figure on the right hand side, you can see that um, summer um, in summer heat waves have led to a record number of days with very strong heat stress, especially in the South Europe. Um, and those extreme conditions were also quite um, uh, contributing to, to, to strong droughts. Um, and actually, into this report, it is possible to see what happened in, in the year, in the previous year, but also to put it in the context of the past, the many past years. In, in, at the bottom of this slide, you can see a time series of the evolution of the percentage of days um, with very strong heat stress for summer. And you can see how this percentage of days is changing year by year and how it is um, increasing. Okay, so if we take a look at the heat stress now and we go a bit zoom in the different areas in Europe, this is a zoom over the alpine space area. Um, and this uh, looks and this shows the, um, the, the value of, of this number of, of days with extreme heat stress. The figure, how you can see there is an orange area, is just a snapshot um, showing how the, the, those number of days um, in year 2003. And the orange color is telling us that, for example, in this area, um, we had more than 30 days of extreme heat stress. Um, and um, if, if, you, if, you, if you look at the, of, of, at the top uh, time series, uh, this is, time series shows the deviation of these high extreme heat, day, heat stress days with respect to the long-term average. And we can see from the, um, in this case, from, this goes from the 1980s, um, to last year, how this is um, uh, evolved. And you can see clearly an increase with a strong um, peak for the year 2003, for example. If now we zoom closer to a region, in this case, the Alsace region where uh, Strasbourg is located, we can see a clear um, increase in the past with different peaks. And here we are talking about more than 40 days of extreme heat. And we are talking about more than a half of an entire summer, just to give you an example of how important are those, uh, those, those extreme heat conditions. We do the same exercise a bit for the uh, now the Valencia region. This map shows uh, the distribution of those extreme days again for one specific summer. This, in this case, I chose the summer 2003 that was very extreme. And actually, if you make a zoom um, over uh, the Valencia area, we now are talking about peaking of days like 60 days of extreme heat with a general increase. But now we want to put this information of the past climate with respect to the um, future climate uh, projection so to understand what to expect in the next decades. Um, and, and actually, um, uh, a way to do that is to look at another climate indicator. In this case, we look at how those heat waves or how those extremes are impacting, for example, the energy sector. Um, one indicator for doing that is looking at these uh, cooling degree days, heating or cooling degree days, depending on the season we look at, which measures how far the outdoor, outdoor temperature is from a given comfort temperature that is used to estimate uh, the energy demand. So when we have a high number of cooling degree days, that is the number shown into this slide, this means that the outdoor temperature is above the summer comfort temperature and a high amount of energy is required to cool down the buildings. Uh, in its definition, it makes use of temperature, of daily temperature, of maximum temperature, minimum temperature, and this threshold of comfort external temperature. And as you can see in the time series um, on the right hand side of this slide, in gray, you see the value of the past and the current year based on those reconstruction of the past that I was telling you before, this reanalysis. And then in colors, you see two different climate scenarios. So how the climate can evolve in the next decades, depending on the um, evolution of um, emission and concentration of greenhouse gases. We have a more pessimistic scenario in orange and a more less pessimistic scenario in green. And you can see a bit where we are by um, comparing this with a gray line that is the current climate. But 
This is again not uh, the full story. Uh, we have to reach down the, the urban skill. Um, and uh, the urban heat island as said is an important uh, effect. And this is mostly related to the fact that um, cities are full of pavements, of buildings, um, of surfaces that absorb and retain um, heat. And this increases the energy cost. And this is actually a very important element because we know that 40% um, uh, of population is living in cities and uh, there, there is expecting again an increase um, in those um, heat island effect uh, under different climate scenarios. An example to look at the heat island climate um, stress. If you look at the, um, this is an example of how it is possible to look at information of the urban heat island uh, by taking uh, this uh, reconstruction of the climate from the past. In order to do that, we need to take the information in this case of the temperature and downscale it at the level of the city. This is an exercise of downscaling to go and to have the resolution of 100 meters to be able to identify and this is the example shown here, um, uh, which are the areas for a specific city. This is an example for Barcelona, where we have this um, enhanced heat island um, effect. Uh, and this is a variable that is named urban heat island intensity. And in practice shows you the difference between the temperature in a specific small area into a city with respect to the rural temperature around it. Uh, now, during this exercise is, um, is quite complex because we know that um, we need to go to the level of the city scale. And uh, historically, for the climate information that we have, when we look at our reconstruction of the climate in the past and we look at the weather forecast and we look at the climate predictions longer in time, the different models that we use often do not go at the resolution of the city. The cities are not very well resolved into those um, climate data. And therefore, um, it is necessary to, uh, to build on top of those and to find methodologies. However, um, recently, um, there have been quite a long, uh, quite important advancement um, into, the, into research, into the data that are available. And it is now more and more possible to resolve um, and, and to give information about the city scale also by looking at this reconstruction of the past um, and looking at the weather forecast. What we plan to have uh, at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast is to have an um, operational system for the weather forecast that uh, reproduce um, uh, the city scale, as well as having the new information on the reconstruction of the climate, those reanalysis that also takes uh, into consideration um, this information. The last element here is that we are not stopping here. Um, research is ongoing to include the uh, urban schemes going really to find, find resolution in global models. And this is done through another exercise. This example shows Destination Earth. This is an ambitious initiative at the European scale. And ECNWF is part of it. Uh, and the aim of Destination Earth is to create uh, what we call a digital twin. And the digital twin is a computer simulation of the planet where we can play with different parts of that. I will leave you with just uh, like this last example as part of Destination Earth. CNWF is contributing to this WMO example demonstrator uh, where um, to support the Olympic Games in Paris in 2024. And the, the project is the aim of the project is to produce this weather forecast, a very fine resolution within Paris. And I thank you. I can leave you uh, with this. Thank you very much. Uh, I see we have already a, a question that probably is going to be also answered uh, later on by the, other, um, by the other speakers, but maybe you can uh, say a couple of things about it. Uh, the question is, uh, air conditioner with fans outside will add to urban heat stress. Do we need to build street cooling networks with chilled water, perhaps storing cool underground from wintertime or springtime? If you, Thank you. Very, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm if not sure if, yes, if this question is directed to me because I'm not an expert on how to build resilient cities. Uh, so what, what I can say is that climate information and, and the different timescales is again giving you the elements for who then uh, decide to build um, a resilient city in order to include this in their new design. So um, that's my answer. Yes, th th thank you, Kara. And yes, indeed, I think this uh, question will be uh, answered quite I'm soon by the, by the yeah. other presentation. So I'll leave you, uh, I'll leave directly the floor to uh, Mattia Kinello. Okay. 
good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm Mattia Chinello. I work uh, for a Red Company. And today I want to explain you the methodology that we are using to assess the cooling uh, um, demand for building in uh, the project Cooling Down. So to introduce a little bit the problem, uh, I want to show you how the capacity of the, the air conditioning system uh, has increased in the last uh, year. This is a, a study for International Energy Agency. And you can see that uh, uh, both in residential and commer commercial sector, the, the capacity installed of the cooling system uh, was increased a lot. And uh, uh, obviously also the energy demand. Uh, also the provision for the future of the uh, air conditioning availability um, will increase a lot. Here you can see in this study, there are different scenarios, but uh, in any case, all over the world, the, the air conditioning uh, capacity and availability will increase a lot. So in these uh, other uh, graphs, you can see that uh, also the energy consumption for cooling uh, will increase a lot um, in the baseline scenario. So the baseline scenario is with the current technologies. Uh, and um, obviously this, uh, um, this increasing is also for electricity demand and for CO2 emissions. But uh, the important thing is that you can see here is the difference between the, the baseline scenario with the, with the current technologies and the efficient cooling scenarios with uh, uh, an increasing of uh, the efficient of cooling system and the use of renewable energy, we have uh, a big difference in 2050. So it's important to study this, uh, this sector to understand how the, the demand will increase and um, what the technology we can use to redu reduce the demand of energy for the cooling sector. So this is the, the scope of the project uh, cooling down. And uh, we, uh, as RED, in particular in the task 2.2, we want to evaluate the cooling demand for residential and for res a service sector for the present and for the future. So I want to explain uh, very quickly the methodology that we, we are using because it's, it's still a work in progress to evaluate uh, this demand. So we define the cooling demand for 2016 for residential and non-residential buildings. Uh, 2016 was taken as the starting point because we have the statistical data of building for this year. Then we validate this cooling demand comparing with other studies and other uh, literature resource. Then we actualize this cooling demand for the present, so for 2022. Then we, we want to also to evaluate the actual cool floor surface. So the saturation of the potential demand, how much buildings are effectively cooled then make some projection for the, the future, okay, for, uh, for potential and also for saturation, and then evaluate uh, the electrical demand and its evolution. So we start with the, the building database from uh, European Building Stock Observatory. Here we have uh, the, the building floor area for each country uh, for residential and non-residential buildings for different type of buildings. And for every type of building, we have the different construction period. Then we use uh, some cooling load profile that the University of Padua evaluate uh, with the dynamic simulation in another project, uh, GPGSP, uh, in which we participate some years ago. 
And you can see that we have uh, different type of residential building uh, and different type of non-residential building with a different level of insulation and also different climate uh, with uh, for different cities around Europe. So we have a, we have a lot of uh, cooling load profile and uh, uh, what we did is to match all this profile with the data of buildings. So uh, with, uh, uh, with the different type of building, different types of, of profiles, with the different climate of each country, the different cities around Europe, and different level of insulation with the different construction period of the buildings. So at the end, we, we, we add uh, all these uh, uh, categories of building and we can evaluate an weighted average uh, yearly cooling demand for each country. Uh, here I report some results to give you an idea. This is the specific energy demand for residential buildings. So the kilowatt hour per square meter here. Uh, I put in comparison with the other project. So uh, our evaluation is the red one. Then we have uh, hot maps, Stratego, and the heat roadmap Europe. These are other projects that evaluate the cooling demand. You can see that there are some difference because every project use different method to evaluate the cooling demand, but we are plus or less in the same range. This is for residential, then we have also for service building. And you can see that service building requires uh, more energy for cooling. Then we go, we go on and we, we want to actualize the cooling demand for the present. So what we have done is to take into account uh, the, the new buildings and the deep renovation of the building from uh, European statistics and also taking into account uh, the climate effect uh, using the cooling degree days, uh, because uh, as was uh, already explained very well in the, in the, the previous uh, presentation, uh, the cooling degree days are increasing. You can see here this, uh, uh, this diagram from Eurostat. And uh, so also the cooling demand uh, are increasing and will increase in the future. This is an example for Italy. There are two different scenarios, but in any case, the cooling degree days, uh, in this case uh, is cooling degree hours, but it's the same concept. Uh, in any case, these cooling degree hours will increase. Uh, and so we have to take into account also this effect. Then another, another thing that we want to evaluate is the actual cooled floor surface. So the saturation, okay, how much buildings are already equipped with the cooling system. So we start from uh, uh, literature data and then we update this uh, uh, with the national statistics that we can found uh, in particular for residential buildings because for service building, there are not a lot of statistics, uh, but we can use market report of units sold and other studies. Uh, this is work in progress, okay? So it's not complete uh, now, but we are working on it. But you can see that in any case, uh, example for Italy and Spain, already half of the building for residential sector uh, are equipped with cooling system and uh, this will increase in the future. This is an example for France. You can see that uh, uh, today um, around 25% of residential buildings in France are equipped with cooling system, but the, the provision is that for 2050, uh, almost all of the building will have cooling equipment. So uh, the cooling demand will increase a lot. Then uh, another, um, another two, the last two steps is to make some projection for the 
for the future, so for 2030, uh, considering again the new buildings and the deep renovation and take into account the, the climate effect and the, the increasing of the install capacity uh, of the cooling system. And then at the end, we can evaluate from the uh, energy demand for cooling, also electricity demand uh, using an average uh, uh, efficient of the system uh, that uh, are installed now and uh, the possible increasing of this efficiency that we will have in the future. So we can evaluate the present and the, the projected electricity demand. So this is what uh, I want to present to you today and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mattia. Uh, we have uh, a question, uh, I can read it for you. Uh, the question is, on which basis uh, did you calculate the electricity demand? Uh, did you calculate it with uh, air-to-air -air heat pumps? Yes, we, have, uh, um, we are working now on the energy demand for cooling. At the end, we will uh, calculate the electricity demand and we want to consider uh, the different efficiency of the different system. So most of the, 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 the cooling equipment that are installed are probably air-to-air -air heat pumps, but there are also air-to-water heat pumps or water-to-water. -water. So we will uh, evaluate an average efficiency of all the technologies that, uh, that are used in the different countries. Thank you. Uh, another question is about the cooling down project. And the question is, at what stage is now the cooling down project? And are there any data available? Um, some data is what I, um, I show you. Um, I think that for the next year, for the beginning of the next year, the, the data will, uh, will be available. Uh, because we are uh, we are at a good stage, but we have to uh, work a little bit on uh, the climate uh, correction and the projection for the future. And then uh, I think that uh, some data can be uh, delivered to to everyone. Okay, thank you. Uh, and maybe also a question um, by my side. Because uh, you, you showed quite a, uh, a complex system that takes into account very um, type of buildings uh, mm -hmm. and in quite uh, some different countries. So I was wondering how uh, difficult was it to put together all this data, especially given the differences that uh, different countries in Europe can have in terms of uh, statistics. And together with that, uh, which were then um, the main sources for all these uh, statistics you put together? Yes, for the, the, the surface of the building, I use, uh, as explained, uh, the uh, Building Stock Observatory of Europe. And here we can have uh, all the different type of building and uh, for every type of building, the different uh, uh, square meter for every country. But uh, the most difficult thing is to uh, find data about the saturation level. So how much building are today equipped with cooling system. This is not so clear because there are a lot of data on heating system and also electricity consumption, but how much electricity is used uh, for cooling is not uh, uh, easy to, found, to find. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you, Matia. One, one of the big problem of, of cooling is um, the difficulty in uh, putting together statistics and to differentiate uh, the statistic, for example, in terms of uh, heating uh, statistic and general electricity demand. Um, thank you again. Uh, so now we will pass to um, a presentation by Borja Badanes, which will talk about the uh, Valencia case. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Borja Badanes from Universidad Politécnica de Valencia in Spain. In this day, uh, I will talk about the 
how we can combat or mitigate the urban island effect through the, the result that we are getting from the cooling down project, currently ongoing, and how integrate this, this solution, these technical solutions in the in the sustainable energy action plan, the SIPs, or the municipality like Valencia. Uh, the, the structure of the of this presentation will be that I will introduce briefly the urban heat island uh, in Spain and in Valencia. Uh, I will also share the outcomes that we are getting from cooling dam project uh, about the renewable cooling and how to integrate this in, into the SIPs, um, how implement this in a GIS uh, system. Okay, this is, for example, a, 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 heat, a heat map of the city of Valencia, when we can see the, the effect of the island heat effect, uh, mainly in the, in the city center of, of the city. This is from, from the Mapa de Calor de España, has, has made for the energy agency in, in Spain. And as you can see, this is, there are some uh, Areas in the in the city where the the heat uh, urban is run can appear, and other other effect that we can take in, into account is is the the peaks in, in the electricity demand. In this graph, you can see the the peaks in electricity demand in winter and in summer, and one important. Uh, milestone or is, is that uh, last year is the, the first time that the the summer cooling peak has exceed the winter heat, uh, heating peak. Then also these two first slides shows the, the need that we need an efficient and renewable cooling in, in the cities. For this, to, to give this, this, this goal, this objective, one key tool to fight the urban heat island is through the, the SIPs, okay? The Sustainable Energy Action Plans for the municipality that uh, come from, from the Covenant of Mayor. Covenant of Mayor is, is uh, uh, a seal that uh, was uh, seen at different cities from uh, 28, and he has three main commitments, is the reducing the emissions, enhancing the resilience, uh, taking, tackling the energy poverty. Okay, uh, even with the SIPs uh, in place, we have, uh, we have uh, challenges. The or two primary concerns are about the 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 Surya accurate greenhouse uh, how greenhouse gas inventories and also important uh, action that one well, that we have to solve is how to measure the effectiveness of the actions uh, we need better tools to measure the the future impact of the actions and and also to work in the follow-up of, of the mission. Therefore, uh, within the renewable and FNC cooling, uh, we can take action in, in the SEAP in, in several areas, like the equipment of the municipal buildings and also in the residential sector and the tertiary sector. This is the area that we can cover uh, in the SEAP, uh, improving the, the cooling, uh, the renewable cooling system. Then in, in the scope of, of the cooling dam project, we have carried out a extensive uh, compilation of the renewable cooling technology and hope they can be applied effective, effectively. Also, we are taking in account what is the level 
of the development of, and the market reality of, of these technologies. Then try, trying to measure these, 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 these tools, okay, the, the results of um, cooling down and, and the SIPs. Okay, uh, we need to measure what the, the impact of the renewable cooling technology that can have in the in the in the town in the in the municipality. Then in the project we we have developed a, a methodology considering various uh, various indicator uh, in the field of the energy, environmental, market and financial, uh, and social. The aim of this indicator is is measure what is the impact of the renewable cooling systems in the city. Uh, for this purpose, uh, our objective is, is evaluate the, the impact of, of this indicator using uh, his maps uh, tailored uh, to each municipality, supported by various uh, thematic maps. And the final objective is, enabled, is that with this, uh, is available to, to to perform a strategic, a strategic decision making approach. For example, we are working to uh, that in a municipality using the cadastral data, uh, make estimation of its the cooling demand using the uh, Eureka tool, and also the other other thematic map that we are supporting. we are using is is you can estimate the the heat is administered in, in the area of the, of the city. With this, the final objective that we, we, we want to, to, to reach is to, to have an impact map showing the application of the renewable uh, technology across all the building of the municipality. And that can, can be seen, can be shown in the, in the slide. And with this, we will have a GIS based multi-criteria decision making process that we will help to, to the municipality energy planner to we will help in, in making informed decision from the energy plans. Okay, that's all. Thank you for your attention and uh, hearing my contact and for any question. Um I have I have a question uh, specifically about the uh, sustainable energy action plans that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, my first question is: uh, Do you uh, do you think that uh, municipalities have the the capacities uh, and capabilities to to deal with them and and to draft um, proper uh, plans? And are they actually uh, doing it, or you think that further efforts are needed both internally and externally also to, for example, integrate uh, the cooling part into into these plans? And the second question linked to that is, uh, how many cities actually uh, uh, do you know, for example, that in Europe um, already drafted uh, such plans? Yes, I I, I say in, in my, the, I will start with the second Question, okay. Uh, I, in the, uh, as I say, as I say the, the, the action plan are linked with the governor of Myers. Governor of Myers has, seen, has been seen by over uh, 11,000 cities in, in Europe. Um, if you want to, 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 to join them, you are, uh, it's mandatory to, to make the, these uh, energy plans and um, make, uh, Measures okay uh, to improve your energy energy start, uh, energy plans of, of your city. Uh, the problem is that uh, the, all the cities in general, for example, or or experience in, in Valencia in Spain, they the technical the technical plan the technical energy planners uh, need helps to. To, to do this because they generally uh, work uh, without uh, a proper uh, impact assessment of, of the technology that they wanted to use. And usually they only move by because the other, the people are doing this or something like this. 
then or, or rotative in, in, in this project, uh, I said in the in the last in the last slide is try to to do something to to help these energy planners uh, to me to measure the, the impact and also integrate with with the the results that we are getting from pulling down project that we are we are going to promote the, the more efficient and more uh, renewable uh, cooling system that can be used in, in the in the cities. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Borja. Just want to remind the uh, people participating to this webinar that they can still put their questions in the um, chat box. Uh, so let's pass to the last presentation of today. A uh, presentation from Jean-Baptiste that will show us a specific uh, case of uh, use of geothermal to cool a uh, data center in Strasbourg. Jean-Baptiste, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. So for nice to, happy to, to share this uh, example with you. Um, so I will talk to you about um, an example in, uh, in Strasbourg. Um, I hope you, you, you see only my presentation and nothing else. It's fine. Yes. So, yes. So this is a project we have done uh, a couple of years ago now uh, for the Unistra University in Strasbourg, and they are were building a new uh, data center for the university. They have um, a data center for the calculations of the of the the people there, and also they built a, a new building. So the idea was to uh, to provide the the data center with a, a system that wouldn't. Uh, be uh, air conditioned, but uh, through geothermal uh, systems and using free cooling. So I will share with you the the, the way we have dealt with the, the the project. And at the end of my presentation, I will try to uh, enlarge a little bit the, the the discussion about what could be done in cities and the challenges, and how maybe uh, geothermal systems can provide a solution. So the concept here is uh, for the data center is to have uh, both free cooling and active cooling. And in fact, the in the data centers, uh, not um, all the systems need the same uh, power for cooling, especially the machines, computers need a, a high uh, cooling mode. So basically it's quite difficult to do it with a uh, free cooling only, though it's still a geothermal system. But on the other side, when you are doing the storage, uh, these uh, storage uh, systems are not uh, active systems and they need a lower um, range of uh, energy to maintain them uh, at a lower temperature on one side. And also on the other side, um, they can um, support a higher temperature. So basically, uh, this is possible to do some free cooling for these uh, elements. So in this project, uh, the water coming from the ground is used at the first time, uh, at the first scale, or at the first stage, sorry, uh, to make a free cooling of these uh, storage systems. And then it goes to uh, heat pumps, which will uh, provide lower temperatures to, to uh, lower the temperature of the computers. But on both cases, of course, uh, it's a geothermal uh, system that is used. So uh, also in this project, uh, part of the energy from the data center is used for heating the, the building of the university. So basically, uh, as long as uh, it is possible, the, the, the heat is used for the university. And especially in summertime, when there is no heating of the building, the heat is, um, is uh, injected into the, the ground. So this is a little bit... Um, more specifically to, to show you the project. So the project is, a, is in the very center of, uh, of Strasbourg. As you can see on this, uh, on this uh, photo or image, there are a lot of uh, other projects around the, this project. And it, this is very specific in Strasbourg because uh, the, basically the, the rain, the rain, the rain in um, maybe the, in, in German, I guess, uh, is, uh, is basically uh, uh, under all the city. So it's quite easy to make some geothermal systems in the city. And some people have done some, some projects before uh, we did this uh, data center project. And uh, therefore there is an issue of uh, doing a, and a challenge of doing a new project within all these existing projects and, and have uh, as less uh, inference on the other projects as possible. 
And I will talk to you later in this project about this. Uh, do you see my my um, my my pointing or not? No, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Okay. So I will talk to you a little bit later about the N size project here, and also here about this uh, Lebel project, and also here about this uh, this project here, which are inside an INSA existing geothermal uh, project. So for this project, the needs are, are quite high because basically they need a 1.1650 uh, 1, uh, kilowatt of power, which is quite huge. Um, so the, the project was designed for a, a temperature difference of five degrees. And so basically it's around 300 uh, cubic meters per hour that is needed, which is quite huge. But as I told you, uh, Strasbourg is, is very specific because there is a very high flow uh, uh, below the city. So it was possible to cover this need with only uh, two, um, two drillings, uh, one geothermal doublet to make it. Though uh, in this data center, there are some uh, high requirements of uh, security and basically they, they cannot uh, stop the, the cooling system. So to, uh, we propose to double the system with uh, two doublets. So basically you can see on the bottom right that it's a uh, four for drilling that were done, two times uh, a doublet to uh, be able to make uh, the, to, to, uh, to secure the, the, the cooling of the building because in, in, ca in case of a maintenance of one of the, of the, the drillings or any problem, uh, we wanted to make sure that they would be able to um, to secure and uh, and um, deliver the the cooling mode for the for the data center, and also as a, a second security, we suggested that they they would um, have a, a spare space on the roof to be able uh, to put a rooftop and a, 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 a air conditioning system in case there would be a problem with the geothermal system. All this was to secure the. The university on the project and and um, make it possible to grow through the project because they wanted to make to be one hundred percent sure that there wouldn't be any problem with the geothermal system. So that was that's how we cope with um, with this issue. Um, in in uh, in Strasbourg, it is a little bit uh, it's quite interesting. So I would make a small focus on that. Uh, there are several layers um, to get the water, and as you can see here. Uh, basically, there are some patches of uh, of clay um, in the layers, so that um, the, the the two layers are sometimes they are together and sometimes they are separated, and it is usual in Strasbourg to pump um, on the lower level and to reject on the higher level, and you can you will see in the following of the presentation that it was very interesting because um, it it made it possible. To, um, to have our project close to another project without having too much interaction with this project. So we decided to make a separation between pumping and rejection flows. Um, in this case, uh, in France, and I will make a small focus on the French regulation, you have two cases. Either you are below 500 kilowatts um, of energy taken from the ground, or 80 uh, cubic meters per hour. And then you can make a, just a declaration on the internet. And basically the next day you can start your project. If you are uh, in this case also, you only have to demonstrate that you don't have uh, more than four, four degrees of influence on the ground, of, on the ground water uh, at 200 meters from your project. And if it's the case, you can do your project but of course, you have to take into account the existing projects. That's why I call my uh, slide first arrives, first served. It means if there is nobody around, you can do your project. You just have to care that your project doesn't impact anybody else that would be able, would uh, like to make a project in the future uh, in an area of 200 meters or above. And if you arrive after them, of course, you have to, to demonstrate that you don't impact that project. In this case, in this project, uh, we were far above uh, the 500 uh, kilowatt. So we were under what we call authorization process, which takes uh, between six months to one year to, to, to go through because there is what we call an impact study and you, you have to see all the potential impact on, on the ground and so on. So it's a, a heavier process. So this, um, this level of 500 kilowatt might uh, be uh, taken uh, to higher level 
to help the, the development of geothermal systems in France. In our case, we had uh, three projects that were quite close to our project. One was below uh, or downhill from our project, I would say. So in fact, we had a positive influence on this uh, project because we were we are going to heat the water. And basically, they are only doing uh, heating of the building. So if the water is um, at a higher temperature, it will improve the performance of their, their installation. So there were no problem with this. And I will enlarge the discussion later on about these possibilities. The other one was on, on the side of our project, but we, we made the demonstration that there was no impact. And then there was another project where the, the it was more difficult because it was quite close to our project. So we had to make the mod uh, to modelize the system and we modified uh, our project to uh, low, to have no impact with this existing uh, project. So here you see uh, uh, how it goes. So you have the pumping uh, in blue, which is uh, between um, up to 70 meters deep, but it's not so deep in fact. And the rejection uh, well, which is uh, down to uh, basically 30, 20 or something, 25 meters, so which is not so 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 deep. And on the right, you see uh, our project, which is called Site, and you see the the black uh, arrow is uh, the, the direction of the of the water. And in this case, so we were pumping uh, uh, here uh, in the in the blue area and rejecting on the red one. And then we made a, um, we modelized this with a fee flow with um, and we we tr we we showed and we calculated the inference on the other uh, systems. And this is an interesting uh, graph because you can see on the left side. Uh, the influence of uh, our project on the lower side of the of the water, which is the, the what was the red uh, the red uh, the red one, and you can see that uh, Pompage and size, which is the project the project with a little bit of uh, issues, in this case they would have an impact from our project, but basically uh, due to the fact that we have separated the the two sides. And we are rejecting on the upper part, but they are pumping on the lower part. Basically, the inference of our project on their um, on their pumping side is uh, is quite uh, low. And basically, we showed that there was no problem. The only thing we had to do is to uh, move a little bit our uh, rejection uh, drillings on the left, on the west side, to make sure that we wouldn't have any uh, impact on their project. And this is the, the, the graphs of all the existing projects. You see there are quite many of them. And for each uh, existing project, we calculated uh, what was the impact of our project and made sure that we wouldn't uh, have a long-term influence on their, on their project. And finally, this is what you can see on the left side that was the initial positioning of our project of the rejection wells, which are the, the red spots on the right. And after doing all these studies, uh, we decided to uh, move them to the left side. And also the, the conclusion, because we had two possibilities, was to, to, to get uh, half of the, of the flow on the two wells. But finally, we decided that it was better to do 100% of the flow on the left well, uh, the, the western one, to um, lower the influence on the existing project and keep the second one 100% uh, as a security. Though there is a small challenge about maintenance of the of the drillings because the right one is not used um, at, on a regular um, mode, so um, it can be a problem on the long term if people don't take care because when you want to use it, maybe it's not uh, uh, functioning very well because it, it has not been tried or maintained correctly. But this is the conclusion of, uh, of the studies. And now as a conclusion, uh, I would like maybe to open a little bit the discussion about the, the, the potential of uh, geothermal systems for uh, cooling in cities. Uh, as you can see in this project, it's a, it's a great potential, especially in bigger cities that are often close to rivers. So basically, uh, a lot of them have, uh, because it was transportation, uh, it, was, it was making easy for people to transport uh, elements in the old times uh, through the rivers. So you have a lot of big cities that are close to rivers, so they have a good potential as a Strasbourg. Uh, though um, 
there is a, a negative impact as we, as we showed, uh, we saw in the pr uh, previous presentations of other solutions. And we had a, a project where we, we were looking at the possibility to make a geothermal system, but uh, it was not possible. And basically, they, it was in Paris, and they, they decided to air cool the, the data center in the very center of Paris. And you have 7 megawatts of uh, heat that is going to Paris atmosphere 365 days a year, which is a shame, I would say. Uh, they finally um, uh, managed to get a little bit of heat to a, a building next door. But it, it's quite sad that they didn't manage to either put this energy in the ground or use it for uh, other purposes like eating some uh, other buildings. So, of course, this gives a, a nice potential for cooling and heating of buildings, uh, either through heat pumps or as a free cooling mode for the cooling. Uh, but though, and we can see it a little bit in our project in Strasbourg, you can see there are quite a lot of uh, systems. Uh, when people do too many systems and there is no uh, coordination between everybody, there is a, a limit at, at a point of time. And especially, for example, in Lyon, which is in southeast of France, um, you have a problem in the groundwater at the moment because uh, all the buildings are doing some uh, cooling with uh, the groundwater. And basically, the temperature of this uh, water is, is going up and there is uh, an issue about this. So the best they could do now is to heat some buildings uh, with the same uh, groundwater, which would balance the, the, the energy that, that is brought through the cooling mode. And it could be interesting, I think, that to have an approach at a city scale, we saw some very interesting presentation on Valencia and so on about the, 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 the highland, uh, heat island uh, problems. But I, I have never heard about uh, a study at city scale about what could be done with the, the groundwater and how we could uh, make some grillings some, on some points, uh, have a, 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 a district heating or district cooling and manage the temperature of the groundwater at a city scale. And I think that would be an interesting experience to be conducted in a city and also to... to um, to make this uh, thinking before people do their small projects everywhere, and then it gets a mess, and it's not possible to make this uh, global view on the on the systems anymore. And on that side, of course, uh, you have two uh, different types of uh, uses you can make from this groundwater. You have what we call the low temperature loops, where you provide a, 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 a loop for anybody who wants to use it. And some of them will uh, heat the building, some will make some cooling, and all this is uh, centralized in this loop. And then the extra load uh, needed or uh, in excess will be uh, reinjected of, or taken from the ground. And uh, in another case, you can also make some centralized uh, heating or cooling. For example, in Paris, they, they have a cooling system which is uh, done with heat pumps that are on the Seine River. Uh, which is interesting, though it has an impact on the SEM, and which can be um, uh, worse than the impact of uh, getting it in the ground. So this is for my presentation. Thank you very much. And if you have any question, uh, I would be glad to, to answer or uh, have a discussion about this uh, possibility to do city scale uh, thinking rather than project uh, thinking. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jean-Baptiste. Very interesting presentation indeed. Um, there are some questions in the chat, so maybe I can uh, read to you a couple of them. Indeed, it really seems that uh, the issue of, of storing um, and storage in, uh, in general um, is it's quite important. And so some people in the chat is, um, is uh, uh, they're having questions about that. I think you partially answered um, some of them. But maybe just to to sum up um, about uh, storage, because for example, one question is uh, from David, uh, which says, "If I understood correctly, you exchange heat with underground water, warming it. But since this water is flowing, you cannot store this thermal energy and recover it for later uses." A link to that is another question that says, "Have you also considered an aquifer thermal energy system, the so-called ATIS at?" Um, the other side. So you, you already discussed a bit of the problems uh, linked to um, to storage, uh, but if you want maybe to add something about it and the different solution that can be found also in, in your case in Strasbourg. 
Yeah, we have studied a little bit the storage issue because uh, at a point of time that was a little bit uh, um, on the people were thinking about it. The problem of, of wanting to store in the in the ground water, I think uh, this is a personal opinion, is that you don't really uh, have a good control about the, the water flow. It's very specific or any any place you are. So I know they have done it, for example, in uh, Holland, uh, where they store uh, some heating in the summer and then they, they, re they reuse it in the winter. But it, it's a very specific place where there is no flow of water. So it makes sense because they have a good rate of uh, uh, of, of taking back what they have put in the ground. In case of a river or here in uh, in Strasbourg, it's very difficult to to deal with it. So I think, uh, um, and we have studied it uh, on on a, on a couple of cases, but we didn't think that if you we talk about injection of uh, of uh, heat that wouldn't be, for example. Uh, because of cooling and it's really uh, done specifically for taking it back at a point of time uh, the, the the percentage of uh, efficiency is not very high so in terms of economical or technical uh, efficiency it's not fantastic i don't know if i'm very clear in this so i think it's better to say okay um, i take some some water some heat from the water or i i inject heat in the water and then it's nice that later on i do the opposite side on my uh, project so that my inference on the ground is uh, is at zero or close to zero, or uh, maybe later on some people re uh, reuse it uh, at a later stage. But I, I'm not very convinced about the doing some storage projects on the spot really on a only on this um, on this vision. I, I think it's um, the efficiency is not great, but I'm not sure I'm very clear in my answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> maybe some people will understand me better. Uh... What what I think is that it's better to think um, about, uh, for example, if I take Lyon at the moment, they are the 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 ground the ground water is is going up. Anywhere they would uh, they would they would heat some buildings and they would cool the the water it would be a nice move to to be done. It's not necessarily uh, of making higher uh, calculations about what is is uh, going on on one place. But I think I'm not very clear. But I would be glad to to talk later on with someone if they want to to have a discussion with me or with my uh, my email. And to have some feedbacks because I would be very glad also to have some input from other people, which is interesting part of these uh, webinars. Huh? So if anybody has some data on that, I would be glad to share with them. Yes, thank you. Indeed, then you can also have a look for uh, the the questions. That are put on on the chat. I've tried uh, to read some some of them, and indeed some of our half question, half suggestions. Uh, for example, they also suggest why not thinking uh, the heat produced by the cooling as a um, waste heat, giving it to neighbor buildings. I think you you already mentioned it. Uh, That's it, what they do. They do the, the project. Yes, cases. they reuse it in the university, which is a good move. Yes. Yes. Um, that another group of, of of question, let's say, is more on the um, on the permission side. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, a specific question says, uh, "How long did it take to get the permission for the uh, major of four DGC and eighty uh, megawatt hour? Uh, was this uh, an easy process?" No, it's quite a difficult process. I said it, it's usually said, said it's six months, but the reality it's more than between eight to 12 months. So it's, it takes around one year to deal with uh, all this because you have an impact, uh, uh, what we call étude d'impact. So you, you, you have to demonstrate you have no impact. And then there is a, what we call in France, uh, enquête publique. Then they open uh, the possibility to anybody to make a comment on the project. So it's public. It's a publicly uh, 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 shown. And then they have a, a, a time, it's a couple of months or where people can say, okay, I agree, I don't agree, whatever. And then you have someone who finally give a decision. So by the time you have to build the, the demonstration, have this questioning of everybody who wants to get, get their opinion, plus the, the person who makes the conclusion, if he's okay, it's between six to one year and it's closer than one year. So it's fairly long. So at the moment, as I said, uh, the government is uh, is uh, thinking about uh, uh, raising the the limit from 500 uh, kilowatts to uh, one megawatt. 
which I think would be a good idea. The problem is that actually when we're doing projects, basically you have small projects or you have big projects. And big projects uh, like big uh, buildings uh, for uh, office buildings, it's very often above 500. So if you have a very nice uh, office building, you could cool. Uh, it's it's getting complex and fairly long, and usually they, you are above the the, the time lapse of the projects. So they say, okay, it's interesting, but it's too long because we need to take a decision, and they they move to a, a classical uh, air conditioning system. So it is really an issue. So I guess uh, if they move this for to one megawatt, would be a good idea. Of course, you will need to keep some guide, some uh, limits. Like if you say you have to demonstrate you have not uh, more than four hundred four degrees above two hundred meter. In fact, you don't care if it's one megawatt or two megawatt, as long as you uh, get into this uh, four degrees at two hundred meters. If you get above, for example, this four degrees at two hundred meters, then maybe it would be useful to have this authorization process to make sure you don't completely spoil the the water uh, for one kilometer or something. But I think it would be smarter to uh, move to a, a control to your impact at a certain distance than uh, to the power you are using because it depends on the on the 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 the, 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 the ground uh, the ground source and as you were mentioning the ground source one question is about which kind of consideration were taken into account for maintaining the water integrity for the uh, rejection well and if uh, there is uh, some uh, affecting of the drinking water in the ground in some yes, ways, yes, it's a good question because I didn't say it in my uh, in my uh, in my document. I for I forgot why I, because you have a couple of uh, things that you have to be taken you have to take care of. In France, it's not allowed to reject water above thirty two degrees in the ground. They consider that uh, below thirty two degrees, you don't uh, have uh, there is no risk or limited risk. You will have an impact on the groundwater quality, like uh, viruses or whatever. But if you are above thirty two meter thirty two degrees, then there could be some proliferation of uh, whatever. So it's not it's not allowed in any case. In if you are in the what they call shallow geothermal systems. So we 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 checked, of course, and uh, we made sure that we wouldn't uh, go, uh, exceed these thirty two degrees. But this is a French regulation. Okay, and a question linked to that. So you mentioned this thirty two degrees rule. Is that uh, if do you have a monitor program to follow this uh, environmental uh, effects? If there is sort of monitoring. Uh, no, we don't. Uh, in in France, again, you can get some subsidies to make the geothermal uh, systems. When you get the subsidies, you have to monitor your project for at least one year. And 20% of your subsidy is conditioned to the fact that you, you, you give feedback of your project. They want to make sure it works properly and so on. But in, in, it's more about the, the, the power and the efficiency of the, of the system. They want to make sure you, you are in, the, uh, in line with what uh, they, they, the money they gave. But there is nothing about the temperature. At the moment, they don't, want, they don't expect you to monitor the temperature. So there is no uh, no follow up, and this is an issue, and, and also for us because we do a lot of projects, but we it's very seldom we have some feedback actually because uh, then uh, nobody monitors nothing, so we never know. We we suppose they they work properly because there are people who call us back, <laughs> but it would be like, it would be nice to uh, to make this monitoring. So we are also quite active in a um, geothermal in a foundation of buildings. And we we are we are doing some project on that, and we have decided to monitor all our projects in the future so that we can get some feedback with, which we don't have at the moment. But it has a cost, unfortunately. So, but on the in this case, it's a it's a decision of our company because we want to get this feedback and we don't have it at the moment. Okay, thank you, Jean Baptiste. Uh, I see another question that maybe can be answered uh, also by by other speaker. Uh, the tool, um, it's dealing about comparison with um, different systems. So how much smaller are uh, the local electrical demands uh, compared to uh, cooling with air fan conditioners? So in terms of, uh, let's say, efficiency and then uh, cooling demand. Uh, so on like the geothermal solution on one side and the other uh the usual uh, air fan conditioners on the other side. I don't know if uh, either Mattia or 
more has some uh, data uh, on that in terms of uh, efficiency. Comparison between uh, air conditioning and fans. Uh, I don't have uh, specific data about that. Uh, depend of the efficiency of the system, obviously. But uh, so the fans uh, is a very different technology respect to air conditioning uh, with uh, it, it, it pumps. Uh, so uh, it's difficult to find the consumption for fans. Well, maybe just of also the kind of comparison to have like individual uh, solution that's uh, apartment level, building level, and for example, district cooling system, which can be the um like the, the gaining in terms of uh, efficiency and general consumption in these two models surely a uh, single air conditioning system uh, direct expansion devices uh, are not uh, very efficient but are the most uses uh, but for the the city obviously have a district uh, district uh, uh, cooling system will be much efficient uh, and also for the problem of the heating highland effect. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I, could, I would say I would add that if uh, the, the main difference is about the heating island effect, because basically in terms of uh, efficiency, I don't think uh, heat pumps for geothermal systems are much better than uh, air, con air conditioning. Though, uh, if you are doing some free cooling, we have the, the project of uh, the, the airport of Zurich, which is done by free cooling on uh, geothermal piles. And it has been monitored. And with the free cooling, they have a, uh, an efficiency rate of uh, 35 for one. One is uh, heat are the pumps for the free cooling, and 35 is the cooling they, they, they provide in the airport. So it's very efficient. So my opinion would be that if you just compare the heat pumps, uh, air conditioning or water heat pumps, I'm not sure the difference is so so big, but you have the 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 island effect which you you avoid. But if you do free cooling, then it's uh, it's the difference is is huge because basically you have no conception on free cooling. I don't know if you agree, Mathieu, on this. Mm, yes, but usually usually uh, geothermal heat pumps are in any case more efficient than an air system. But obviously, if you do free cooling, uh, it's much better. But the the efficiency energy ratio usually is a little bit higher if you have uh, uh, geothermal heat pumps. It depends also to by the source, obviously, and the, the temperature of the ground or the water. Okay, thank you for these answers. Uh, I don't see other. Uh, questions in the chat. There are more, like comments that you can also um, have a look at. Let's see if there is if there are any final uh, questions on that. In any case, you have st you're still on time to to write some final questions. We can answer also uh, directly in the chat. Uh, you can have a look at the chat. We all already answered uh, lots of questions uh just uh writing mode so here you can see also uh other um interesting informations about that so thank you very much to to all of speakers i think this has been a very interesting uh meeting uh we started out with um a very interesting overview on the heat island effect around europe uh, and then, uh, thanks to the cooling down project, uh, partial results that uh, we already have, we've seen how to deal with um, the cooling demand in Europe, especially in, in buildings, and also how this um, heat island effect and this growing cooling demand can affect uh, the situation in several cities with the specific example of Valencia. And finally, uh, we had a great look at the uh, issue of data centers with lots of examples from the city of Strasbourg, which are using successfully uh, geothermal solution, which are also quite useful to uh, avoid further uh, heat island effects. So thank you all again to our speakers.
uh, the, I conclude now this webinar. Thank you to all the people who participated and also sent questions to us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.